Hello. I think the lights are being turned off. That's good. They're not being turned off. Ooh, it's exciting. Hello. Uh, this is the last talk. I'm the thing standing between you and the bar. Um, in fact, I'm not even in your way, so you can just leave at any point. But I hope this will be fun. End to the day. I like this. It's cool. Okay. Um, so Shakespeare. Who has seen a Shakespeare play ever? Yes. Ten things about you doesn't. Ten things I hate about you doesn't count. Basil and Romeo and Juliet all sort of counts. Um, yeah, so, and who thinks that they're a kind of massive Shakespeare fan? Anyone? Like less people? Uh, I assume lots of you know lots about social engineering. No? Okay, cool. <laughs> Wicked. I've kind of assumed you knew a bit about social engineering. That was a bad assumption. Oh well. Let's get started. Um, so a bit about me. I didn't know Chris. University, and then for some reason, I decided to do English literature instead. Seemed kind of more useful for jobs in the future. Um, uh, then I did a master's in Shakespeare because I had no idea what I wanted to do. But I knew I liked Shakespeare. And then I decided to get into journalism, which I kind of liked. But um, it's a very kind of negative industry. Um, people are like, the internet's killing our jobs in journalism. The internet's killing this industry, which seems thoroughly negative when all I do on my smartphone is just read news stories. So yeah, it's changing economic models. But it's not actually killing it, per se. Um, because of that negativity, I got into web and uh, mobile development. It would have been a lot easier if I had studied computer science back at the beginning, but oh, oh well. Uh, I was a victim to uh, hacking early on. I'd made some really, really bad WordPress sites that were an old, outdated version. Discovered how painful it is to clear up the mess afterwards. One of my clients was a photographer. Thanks to me putting some photos in a dodgy place on the server, uh, a very, very famous British rock band had their photos leaked ahead of the press deadline. So thanks to me, which is like... <laughs> So, catastrophic. Uh, I then got into teaching, um, and then from there, where I am now is a company called Decoded. Has anyone heard of Decoded? You work there, you don't count. Um, okay, so yeah, so Decoded, we're a technology education company, uh, and I won't tell you the full story, but uh, the thing that you guys will be interested in probably is we run a Hacker in a Day program. Uh, we're technology education, but we're all about teaching non-technical audiences, so we assume people coming into our classes can barely use a laptop. I you know, don't know how email works, that sort of thing. But often they're very, very senior, kind of CEOs, again, like the people who really don't know how to use computers. And they'll come in, uh, and we kind of saw this big challenge around cybersecurity, and it's an education challenge, so I've put this t-shirt on. It says security through education on the back. Um, and we really believe that security education for non-technical people really, really sucks. It's like grey conference facility in the basement, slide after slide of use strong passwords, don't click on phishing links, that kind of thing. And we wanted to bring this alive for the community outside of this hacking community. So we created the course where we get people hands-on in a day. They port scan on this bank that we've created. They run SQL injections. They crack substitution and Vishnier ciphers. And they do some social engineering too. So it's a really kind of fun educational day. But for us, it's all about bringing security up the priority list within big corporations. That's our, our goal. Any questions on that? No? Good. No more questions allowed. Um, so. But on to Shakespeare. I'm going to structure this in three sections. The author, the attacker, and the attack. That's what we're going to talk about. So first of all, the author, Mr. Shakespeare. And I'm actually going to start off with a bit of a rant about Shakespeare. And the rant centers upon uh, Anonymous. And no, not these guys with the masks and the hackers. This far more evil Anonymous. This film. Has anyone seen Anonymous the film? Someone has. Did you like it? If, iffy, okay. So Anonymous, was Shakespeare a fraud? So that this has been kind of, um, sort of brought up a lot of times. Whenever I tell people I'm interested in Shakespeare, they always say, aha, but he didn't actually write the plays, did he? Someone else wrote them, uh, which is pretty much nonsense. Uh, the theory of kind of this, there we go, a little, there we go. Um, the theory actually started off with this lady here, Delia Bacon. So she was kind of Victorian time, so two or three hundred years after Shakespeare. And she was like, I've read the plays, and there's no way Shakespeare could have written them. They must have been written by a guy called Francis Bacon. So it's this sort of weird Bacon conspiracy uh, came up. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty weird. It kind of re relies a lot around um, like ciphers and cryptography. Um, and it's just totally mad. It reminds me. So there's Alex. Alex, put your hand up. There's Alex, you. It's you. White t-shirt. There you are. Hello. So Alex and Luke. Hi, Luke. So we were like sitting, uh, sort of we looked at the badge contest, and we looked up the audio tracks, and we were trying to sort of decipher it. 
And we kind of got into this weird rabbit warren. I think with cryptography, you can just go a little bit mad sometimes. You're kind of spotting patterns where there are no patterns. Have you seen the DEF CON 23 video, anyone? Yeah, it's fucking great. Uh, this cipher, this 23, and you start seeing 23 everywhere. I landed in Vegas. It was 23 was my baggage claim. You can actually go mad with this stuff. And this is madness, what goes on here. I'm still been looking it up today, actually. Uh, this is a great book if anyone tries to persuade you that Shakespeare's books have got hidden cryptographic messages hidden in them. This book proves them wrong. It's not true. Um, they do things like this. So this is quite hard to see, so I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, these are the opening lines of every single Shakespeare play. You can see B, A, where's the C? C, C, there we are, C, O, N, bacon. And then if you go backwards from the bottom, F, R, A, N, C, I, you see what they're doing? So this guy here, who's made the website with the smallest typeface possible, I think, uh, looked into this, and he found, uh, and his name is Donald E. Fulton, and he found in the same thing, D-O-N-A-L-D, and then you go from the bottom, F-U. So there's like utter, utter madness, and I kind of found this other website here. How many ways are there to spell bacon? And apparently using the, Francis Bacon did actually use a cipher, that bit is true using the Bacon cipher, all these words, affirmation, affirmatives, believest, all include the word bacon. So you can start reading Shakespeare's plays, or indeed any work in the English language, and decide there are hidden messages about bacon involved, <laughs> which just feels kind of utterly insane. Um, so no more about these, th these guys, but um, I think there's a slightly darker element to this as well. Like, uh, the main assumption of these people, beyond these weird cryptographic clues that don't really exist, is that um, Shakespeare couldn't have written this because he was just a kind of working class guy from the, the kind of Midlands in the UK, from Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, it must have been someone like Francis Bacon who had a university education, worked in the court, that kind of thing. Which is a bit like saying there's no way four working class lads from Liverpool could have written the songs of the Beatles. It must have been someone who studied at the Royal Academy of Music. So it's quite like um, just bullshit. And here's a shake. Am I allowed to swear? I don't know if I'm allowed, Am I allowed to swear. Yeah, okay, great. Um, and this is a quote from Macbeth, which sums it all up. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Um, and that, that is how I feel about that. So I'm afraid that's the end of my rant. If you disagree with me, please find me afterwards. Yay! Shakespeare, Stratford-upon-Avon. So Shakespeare's been in the news before, around cybersecurity before. Um, there was a, a thing discovered a few years ago called Shylock, a bit of malware. Has anyone heard of Shylock? Uh, it kind of mainly affected the UK, actually. Um, and it was targeting UK banks, and it was kind of siphoning off funds and kind of getting into, like, internet banking customers, like, uh, websites and apps, that kind of thing. Um, it was pretty sophisticated, and they analyzed the kind of, looked at the source code, and they found out that, you can't really see that, but in the actual file descriptions on these kind of payloads, give me your blessing, I am Launcelot, your boy, and draw her home with music. Shall I witness, I set forth as soon as you. So it's lines of Shakespeare from The, the Merchant of Venice, which is why it got called Shylock, Shylock from The Merchant of Venice. I don't know, there's no indication that these guys actually knew what they were doing when they put in lines of Shakespeare. But apparently it's like a good way of making it look like natural English to a British audience, but there we go. So I guess more of the question, that's cool. And I guess I like that uh, whenever you do something around Shakespeare, people get interested. Everyone's got an opinion on Shakespeare. Most people, as we've seen, have seen a Shakespeare play. Uh, kind of the, the fact you've even bothered to turn up shows this kind of Shakespeare gets people interested. I don't know why. I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, and this is, this is what Shakespeare's got to do with social engineering as far as I'm concerned. Performance art, I don't know if you can see in the background, that's the Globe Theatre in London. Has anyone been there? It's reconstructed, it's not the original one. Um, got kind of blown, blown up in a, they set up a cannon in Henry VIII once actually. And that um, like hit the wall and started a fire and the Globe burnt down. So it's Shakespeare's fault the Globe didn't exist. Um, so well. So performance art, but I've put quotation marks around this because this isn't actually anything someone said about Shakespeare. This is a line from Kevin Mitnick's The Art of Intrusion. He calls social engineering a performance art. And it kind of goes a little bit further. When you combine the art of influence and persuasion with an inclination for deceiving people, you have the profile of the typical social engineer. And that is alive and kicking in lots of Shakespearean characters. So let's have a look at some of the attackers. Um, Shakespeare's source material uh, for a lot of these villains comes from this book. This is uh, Niccolo Machiavelli, the prince. People heard of Machiavelli? Yes. yes. Uh, um, so Machiavellian is this kind of big word. So Machiavelli wrote this political treatise, and it's all about how you gain power and how you retain it. 
And there's loads of quite kind of cynical uh, lines in there. Like, it's, if, you, if there's choice between being feared and loved, it's better to be feared if you're in a kind of political position. Um, and he also said things like this. Never attempt to win by force what can be won by deception, which is, again, pretty... Actually, I had to choose. There's about 15 really good social engineering quotes in Machiavelli's The Prince. So if you need to fill out a presentation with quotes, he's the guy to go to. And Sun Tzu, The Art of War, gets used a lot, but this is, this is the winner for me. Um, so Shakespeare kind of uh, uses this idea of Machiavelli's The Prince, this idea of this quite cynical guy that's amazing at deception and persuasion and getting people to do things they normally wouldn't do in a various characters. The first big one is this guy, Richard III, here played by Kevin Spacey. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, it's true. Uh, and actually, I was on the way over here, I was uh, flicking through the in-flight um, entertainment, and there was the first episode of season three of House of Cards, and it said in the little description, the Machiavellian schema is back again. So if people have seen House of Cards, I'm asking so many questions, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just interested. Um, so, uh, that character, Frank Underwood, is very, very much that kind of Machiavellian character. And uh, I was reading about it, and actually Kevin Spacey and the director were um, massively studying Shakespeare when they were trying to create Frank Underwood as this kind of political schema. Um, and this guy, Richard III, says things like this. I'm tempted to do it in a Frank Underwood voice. Why I can smile and murder while I smile. But I'm not going to know. I won't do that. Sorry. Uh, Why I can smile and murder while I smile and cry content to that which grieves my heart and wet my cheeks with artificial tears and frame my face to all occasions. So he basically goes around this whole play, um, pretending to be different people to the people he's speaking to, creating this like, weird image around himself. He manages to persuade someone whose husband uh, he has just murdered to marry him, which sounds totally unbelievable and crazy. But if you actually read the like, lines of poetry, I was going to put more of it in here, but we'd be here all day if I quoted Shakespeare all day. But if you read that original speech and see the kind of power of persuasion, how he actually manages to turn her around from someone who actually hates him to someone who ends up wanting to marry him, it's absolutely amazing. And today we're going to focus on this guy. Can you see that? Ish. That's Kenneth Branner. Uh, so he's him, this is 1995's version of uh, Othello. Um, so we're going to look at him, and he says that kind of famous line, I am not what I am. And he is kind of the best Shakespeare character, I think, to look at when we talk about social engineering within Shakespeare. So, the attack. This is what happens. So, Lawrence Fishburne plays the fellow in that, this version. So, he's the kind of the target. A fellow is... People know the plot of a fellow? People? Yeah, so, if I, not everyone does know it, so I'll, I'll explain. So, a fellow is this uh, the guy. He's a moor, he's black. Uh, a time during in kind of European history when being black was definitely not like great if you're living in a kind of the Venetian society that he's living in this period. Um, but he's managed to kind of conquer these sort of stereotypes by becoming this amazing military leader and has earned the respect of, kind of pretty much everyone in society. He's really honorable, very brave, um, and well liked all around. He is uh, served by Iago. So Iago is kind of his right hand man, his second in command. Um, and he's like kind of doing kind of work for Othello all the time, a sort of very trusted advisor. Iago is also friends of this guy called Rodrigo. Um, Rodrigo is uh, basically this quite young guy, uh, kind of a bit sort of headstrong, very sort of Shakespearean idiot type character. Um, and Rodrigo has fallen for the beautiful Desdemona. Um, and Iago is helping uh, Desde uh, Rodrigo reach Desdemona as the play begins. But unfortunately, they've just discovered that Othello and uh, Desdemona are actually been having a relationship and are going to get married. So Rodrigo starts off pretty pissed off about what's happening. At the same time, this guy, Michael Cassio, um, has uh, been promoted out of nowhere to be Othello's right-hand man. So Iago kind of starts off by saying, I really, really hate Cassio. I really, really hate Othello. I want to bring this kind of whole thing down. Uh, that's sort of his motive. We never really find out his true motive, but he, we know that he's, he wants to sort of destroy that kind of top level, if you like. And the other character that we kind of encounter, the kind of probably the other most important character is uh, Iago's wife, Amelia, who's down on the bottom, and she comes in later. So how does he do it? Um, well, I came across this recently, reverse social engineering. I don't know if people have heard about this. There's two sort of definitions of this. One is the one where you kind of turn the attacker back against you. So, sorry, you turn against the attacker, so you actually end up attacking them. There's a second definition, which is the one I'm using for today, 
which is uh, when you actually go get someone to contact you. So you, someone contacts you as the attacker. And there was this great study of how this works in the sort of modern world a few years ago. Um, some researchers worked on uh, some common social networks, so LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and found out ways they could make people make friends with them and then attack them. So you start off, you're the kind of user on Facebook having a lovely time, and you see a lovely recommendation algorithm that will surface up different people that you should probably make friends with. These guys, these look great. Um, and then you click, you make friends with one of these people that seems somehow incredibly tempting. Uh, and you, you befriend them. That person, unfortunately, is, of course, uh, the attacker, who then um, launches their attack upon you. So this, for me, really sums up what Iago's doing all the way through uh, Othello. So when they did this research, they found out that one particular demographic was really, really vulnerable to this sort of attack. Any guesses? Young single users who have expressed interest in women. That is like... <laughs> That is who fell for this every single time. Put a beautiful woman in that recommendations algorithm, and they will always click through and go to them. And uh, that is exactly uh, how Iago starts his, his hack. Um, it's true. He starts with uh, Rodrigo. So what he does, he manages to persuade Rodrigo that... Um, so this is after he's discovered that Othello and Desdemona are getting married. He manages to persuade him that actually, at the same time, Desdemona is having an affair with Cassio can't sort of believe it. He's like, there's no hope for me. So there's two men in the equation he's got to fight against. And then as his trusted advisor, Rodrigo goes to Iago and asks him, you know, what can I do? How can I kind of upset the situation? How can I win Desdemona's heart? To which he says, find some occasion to anger Cassio. The plan is to sort of make Cassio look bad in public, get him demoted, um, and Rodrigo uh, will therefore kind of be able to take his place. So there's a few concepts that kind of get talked a lot about in modern social engineering. Uh, Neurolinguistic programming, NLP, and then kind of within that priming and anchoring. People might be familiar with these concepts, don't know. Um, I guess within Shakespeare, sort of parallels to this exist. Um, it, but it's all about, in, uh, in Shakespeare, it's kind of on and off. This thing. Um, all, in Shakespeare, it's very much about the power of language. I see anything you've really got. Uh, with the kind of original Shakespeare text, how people decide to act it, they can decide, they can play up these sort of ideas of priming and sort of touching people in particular ways or making certain hand gestures, that sort of stuff. But in terms of the language, that's kind of what I'm, I'm interested in here. So there's this really famous speech uh, in, uh, in Othello where Iago is talking to um, Rodrigo. Rodrigo is really, really upset. He's discovered this, this whole kind of Cassio is now having an affair with Desdemona, supposedly. Um, it just feels totally hopeless. He's, Iago's made him go all the way out to Cyprus, and he's feeling dejected uh, and kind of wants to give up. And Iago then launches on this kind of speech to try and persuade him to stay. Um, now, the, he speaks quite quickly in this version, so you might not be able to hear all the words, but don't worry too much. But the idea is he's trying to persuade uh, Rodrigo that the best plan of attack is to sort of go after uh, Desdemona and will win her soul in this way. But all the way throughout this amazing sort of speech, he's putting in this little phrase here. This is where hopefully the sound will be loud enough to hear. We shall see. Put money in thy purse. Follow thou these wars. Disguise thy features with an usurped beard. I say, put money in thy purse. It cannot be that Desdemona should long continue her love to the moor. Put but money in thy purse. When she is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. She must have change. She must fill thy purse with money. If sanctimony and a frail vow betwixt an erring barbarian and a super subtle Venetian be not too hard for my wits and all the tribe of hell, thou shall enjoy her. Therefore, put money in thy purse. Fox on droning, eh? It's clean out of the way. Seek thou rather to be hanged encompassing thy joy than to be drowned and go without her. Wilt thou be fast to my hopes? Thou art sure of me. There are many events in the womb of time which will be delivered. Go and provide thy money. We'll have more of this tomorrow, won't you? Where shall we meet in the morning? At my lodging. Oh, right. <laughs> I'll be with thee betimes. Go to, farewell. Does that hear, Rodrigo? I'd say that. No more of drowning, do you? I'm changed. 
Go to farewell. Put money enough in your purse. I'll sell my lad. <laughs> Last do I ever make my fool my purse. So evil. Love it. Um, that's probably the first time Shakespeare's been shown at DEFCON, which I'm quite proud of, to be honest. Uh, hooray! <laughs> but you can sort of see what he's doing, and it's like, I could keep going again and again, but just go and read Othello, basically. If you're interested in this link between Shakespeare and social engineering, just watching the language of Iago, he does these amazing speeches where he talks about how he's massively duplicitous and is like hiding his true intentions the whole time, and then manages to sort of conjure up this sort of really kind of guide people's thinking. Um, so, the next thing he needs to do is get uh, Cassia into a position where he will actually disgrace himself. So he uses this kind of concept of using language, plus the oldest trick in the intelligence handbook. Any ideas what that might be? Pardon? Booze. Wine. Get people drunk. And it's exactly what he does. So he basically sets out to get Ca Cassia, says, oh no, I've got really weak brains for drinking. I don't like drinking. I'm really bad drunk. And he says, oh, just have one. Come on, all our friends are here. It's the party. And he has one. They start drinking games. They have drinking songs. Discuss how the English are the biggest drunks in the world. Uh, which is possibly true. Um, and this is still something that people use today. Uh, has anyone been to this restaurant before? You have? Wow. <laughs> yeah. So this is in Canada. Um, hooray. Uh, so this is a Chinese restaurant. And it was a subject a few years ago to uh, this headline in Toronto. A Chinese delegation who got some top border officials so drunk that one vomited in a drunk government car was seeking information to help their Communist Party breach our national security programs, police suspect. So this still is like an active attack that people are using today. Just get people drunk. You can get information. You can make them do things they uh, weren't originally intending to do. So he gets Casio, absolutely plastered, um, and then uh, he gets... Uh, kind of arrest, someone tries to calm him down, someone else, while uh, Rodrigo kind of runs away, and the kind of the guards come along, and Cassio ends up stabbing one of them, um, and then uh, Othello says, right, that's it, you're no longer my second in command, Iago, take his place. So Iago succeeded at this point to get into that position. Um, Cassio, however, uh, has also been kind of carefully groomed and befriended by Iago up, up until this point, uh, and Iago manages to persuade him that actually Desdemona is his best chance of getting back into Othello's good books. He says, look at, look at Desdemona, she's got Othello's ear. You know, she's the one you need to talk to. Um, so Iago again steps in, sort of just makes that really clear. Confess yourself freely to her. And Iago says, don't worry, what I'm going to do is I'll arrange for loads of situations where you can go to Desdemona privately and I'll keep Othello away. Um, which is interesting, because then the next person Iago is up to is uh, Othello. And Othello, it's amazing kind of priming sort of technique at the beginning of the speech where he ends up sort of saying to Othello, did uh, Michael Cassio, when he knew of your love with Desdemona, did it, sorry, did Michael Cassio know of your love when you first wooed Desdemona? Did, did Cassio know that you guys were together? And Othello's like, yeah, of course. Why are you asking? He's like, oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. No, no, just, just you know, just, just wondering. And Othello gets kind of starts thinking. And again, Iago begins to sort of seed more of these sort of bits of information until Othello becomes convinced that uh, Cassio and Desdemona are having a secret affair. Um, he says, and Iago says to Othello, look to your wife, observe her well. So, you know, just see, don't worry, just like observe, see what happens. Meanwhile, of course, he's made Cassio trying to kind of secretly go and see Desdemona late at night, whispering in her ear in public. It's basically set this amazing situation up where Othello's only going to see uh, bad things. Um, there's this great book that um, I've looked at. It comes up a lot in the sort of social engineering world. Uh, Influence, the psychology of persuasion. And there's a kind of few techniques in there. Uh, reciprocity, so if someone says, um, if you give someone something, they'll give you something back. Commitment and consistency, so that actually if someone says, okay, if you prove that, I will do this, uh, they're actually more likely to end up doing something. Social proof, if everyone else in the room seems to be kind of giving their passwords up to IT, then okay, I'll do it as well. Um, authority, if you think you're getting a call from someone really, really important, uh, you're more likely to be persuaded by them. This actually happens in Macbeth. Uh, Macbeth gets kind of persuaded by the witches, who are this sort of supernatural authority. How could they be wrong? How could the witches be wrong in saying that Macbeth is going to become the king of England? And that leads Macbeth on this kind of crazy uh, route to decide to murder the current king, because he thinks, well, I'm going to end up king anyway. Sounds a bit crazy, but again, read the play. 
Um, and then liking, if you actually like someone, and scarcity, if there's a limited kind of time period on something, or if there's not much of it, then you, it becomes easy to persuade someone. And this is, again, I did actually have far more slides covering how all of these things happen in Othello, but to give you a sort of bit of a taste of them. Um, the social proof one's quite interesting. So Iago is able to sort of, by going to people and being very kind of open and honest with them, these are all uh, different characters in the play uh, making public statements about him, saying, oh, he's a very valiant fellow, that's an honest fellow, a man he is of honesty and trust, good Iago, and you just keep going. Everyone spends all their time, it seems, in public saying how honest and amazing Iago is because of, he's managed to manipulate them by actually proving that to some extent previously. But the thing that it kind of, um, again, the sort of this reciprocity, this idea of, um, you know, you're, everyone ends up going to Iago for advice. He's always sort of saying, I'm giving you this advice, you know, this is free advice, I'm giving you this, and it sets up this sense of, well, he's given me something, I need to give him something back, and place some trust in him. However, so basically at this point, Othello has been kind of, is sort of driven almost insane by this sort of suspicions and jealousy, and sort of says finally, like, actually, do you know what, he is, he is a very, very strong character, he's not easily deceived, which is what makes the play so great, in my opinion. Um, so he manages to sort of get to the point of saying, okay, like, this is all just stuff I'm sort of imagining and seeing. I'm seeing these kind of meetings. Nothing's actually happening. I need ocular proof. You need to actually give me some real evidence that this is happening. So this is where the kind of the last stage comes in. So Emilia, uh, Iago's wife, has been previously persuaded. And this is the bit that, like, I found people find is a bit like, oh, come on, really? Um, He's been, Amelia has been persuaded previously that Iago really likes a handkerchief that Desdemona was given by Othello, like prior to the play starting. Sort of said, I really love that handkerchief that Desdemona's got, apparently. Uh, and then Amelia, sort of ever keen to please her husband, asks him, you know, what's the thing that kind of you most desire? And Iago says, steal it, steal this handkerchief. So um, Amelia manages, because she's kind of very, very close to Desdemona, Desdemona drops this handkerchief, she picks it up and says, well, I don't want to steal this. What I'll do is I'll make a copy of it and then give it back. Um, read the play. <laughs> um, and then um, Iago basically says, what about that handkerchief that, um, to Othello? What about that handkerchief that Des you gave to Desdemona? Like, have you seen that recently? I'm sure I've seen Michael Cassio mopping his mouth after dinner uh, with that handkerchief. He's like totally enraged, enraged. And Othello ends up sort of, Iago places this in uh, Cassio's bedchamber, and then manages to have a conversation in, within earshot of Othello where he's talking to Cassio. And Cassio's talking about this prostitute he's just had sex with. Um, but Othello ends up immediately suspecting this has got to be uh, Desdemona that he's talking about. And he's obviously being really kind of lewd and horrible about it, really crude, and gets massively... Uh, it's basically, that's the ocular proof that he thinks he's, he's seen. And so he says, you know, she shall not live. And there's this... Uh, that's it, really. Othello ends up kind of going off. Iago says... You know, don't poison her. Fellow says, oh, I'm going to poison her. He says, no, do it in her bed while she sleeps. And actually is so kind of manipulative. He manages to even decide how he murders Desdemona. Um, if you read the original, this is where my Shakespeare geek geekery goes a bit too far. But if you read the source text of Othello as a sort of small tangent, there's only about three or four plays that Shakespeare wrote that we can't find the original source story for. So very, obviously, amazing, incredible writer. But he took, you know, Romeo and Juliet comes from a poem called Romeo and Julietta. Uh, Hamlet existed in the play called Hamlet uh, originally. Um, and Othello was based on this novella by this Italian guy. And in this kind of early version of the kind of source material, uh, Iago ends up going with Othello and beating Desdemona to death with a sock full of sand, which is like the weirdest like, murder ever. Um, but, you know, that's, that's so Shakespeare. You kind of see the genius in how that kind of quite crude story gets transformed into this incredibly poetic situation where he says, I can't. Um, break her skin. She's so pure, she's so honest, she's so true, that I'm going to smother her to death with a pillow. Um, and that's kind of, you know, he still knows she's pure, basically, in that moment, but has been so persuaded by this kind of voice in his ear that he ends up killing her. Um, just as she dies, obviously it's Shakespeare, everyone runs in at that exact moment. Um, she's just died. Um, people run in and say, what's happened, what's happened? And, and then the fellow starts saying, no, honest Iago told me that, um, you know, she was having an affair. I saw the evidence myself. And it all begins to unravel as other people come in and say, oh, no, but he, he made me steal that handkerchief for him. And, oh, no, like, he told me to go and speak to your wife. Um, so it all begins to, begins to unravel. And Othello sort of demands that Iago explain his kind of motivation for why he uh, has kind of got, gone on this kind of quest to destroy him. And sort of rather unsatisfyingly, Iago says, from this time forth, I never will speak word. 
and sort of just leaves it at that. And then Othello kills him. Everyone dies. So it's Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> Othello kills himself. Uh, and that's the end uh, of, uh, of uh, the play. But throughout, what's kind of interesting, and I got thinking about a lot, is Shakespeare's language, obviously, within these characters, within these relationships, language is this massive tool of persuasion, a tool of control. And actually, all the way through um, Othello, we as readers have been kind of guided by Shakespeare, the author. And this word honest, I've said it about five or six times. It's come up in a load of the quotes that you've seen today as well. This word honest just keeps on coming up. Honest, 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 Iago, honest. And in fact, if you look at the kind of, I did some counting, so I'm cool, um, uh, of the word honest in and honesty in Shakespeare's plays. At the top, you can see Othello, and then all the way down, you've got all the other plays. And if you know your chronology of Shakespeare, uh, you'll see that's basically in a pretty much random order of the plays. So there are plays where he mentions words more often than others. And with this one, it's a really clear use of language to sort of guide our thinking around that theme of honesty and deception. And that's actually what Othello is all about. Um, so... Another quote, this one is about um, Shakespeare himself, and this, you get the, kind of the first edition of Shakespeare's collected works. It's got this quote on the front saying, Shakespeare was not of an age, but for all time. And here we are, still kind of going to see Shakespeare, still making films about Shakespeare, still pretending Shakespeare didn't really exist. Uh, it's true. It's kind of, he has outlived the test of time. But I think also, again, flip that on its head and think about social engineering. You, know, we've, like, you can read the books about it. It goes back, you know, the Trojan horse, all these amazing kind of things in history, moments of deception. This is kind of a fundamental part of how we kind of persuade people to do things when they're not meant to do, and it always will be. So that's it from me. Uh, that's a great, and that's a line from a, a Winter's Tale. There's this weird stage direction where it says, exit pursued by a bear. I was hoping there'd be a goon to chase me away, but um, I'm not, 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 no, no such luck. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the end. So thank you very much. If you've got any questions, thank you. Any questions? There we go. <laughs> Question. So, okay, so uh, Othello was that the obvious choice. I think he's the best. Richard III is great, um, and King Lear's a great one. I was going to use that. It starts off with basically with a phishing scam. It's like a forged letter uh, that, he kind of put, that uh, Edmund puts in front of his father and says, oh, I'm just reading this thing, don't worry. And he kind of picks it up, and it's a forged... Well, next year, next year. Next year. Oh, I'll do this something else, it's fine. <laughs> um, and then also, I didn't really touch on comedy, so you've got kind of... Uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, you have Puck, who goes around and puts love juice in people's eyes. It's kind of like Man in the Middle attack sort of thing going on. <laughs> Uh, people, but it goes wrong, and the wrong traffic goes the wrong way. Yeah, love juice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Find out tomorrow. All right. Any more questions? No. Good. Let's go get drunk. Awesome.